everybody. Hope you're having a great day today. We are going to be discussing the world of superconductors, crazy metals that display amazing properties under either pressure or low temperature. Uh, the implications of these things are far reaching, everything from medical to transportation to the energy sector. Um, and we're going to show you some cool examples of uh, what this stuff can actually do. Uh, it looks like it's out of a sci-fi movie, but in fact, it is reality. So it's going to be an interesting one. As always, we've got lots of videos and imagery to break it all down for you. So grab that comfy chair. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Quantum Ladder Podcast. Let's do this. Welcome back to Quantum Matter Podcast. My name is Louis Borges. Joining me today, my good friend and co-host, Mr. Marquise Williams. How you doing? Fantastic. Fantastic. Ready for this show, my friend. I'm ready for this. Yeah. Like uh, many of the topics that we discuss, it takes uh, uh, quite a bit of research and uh, preparation to go through it. Sometimes it's hard to find material, especially with emerging technologies, things that are invented but not quite yet perfected. And you know, the science world likes to, uh, likes to jump all over things and get on that bandwagon and say, hey, we just found the latest and greatest. Sometimes it's not all chalked up to be. So we're going to show you some examples of that in the world of superconductor. It is sort of the holy grail of, uh, of metamaterials, so to speak, moving forward, especially room temperature semiconductors. Uh, effectively, we've, I don't know, most of us have seen little bits of metal floating around. You're going to see it quite a bit today. Um, there are things that happen to those alloys to make them behave that way. But essentially, you know, when you see it, it's it's like something out of a movie, right? You're literally seeing yeah. something levitate. And if we had a material that could do that at room temperature without the need for extreme cooling, I mean, that would literally be like UFOs levitating off the ground. If you could build a craft out of that stuff, it would behave mm -hmm. that way. And the, the rabbit hole deepens as you go. So I'm excited to get into this. What did you think on uh, researching this topic? For So I always go with the futuristic um kind of you know exploration if you will what what's the what is the potential work work what could this be used for and we're going to talk about all that i mean there's you've got a lot of content that you've um prepared for everyone including uh including me too because there's a lot of new stuff in there that i didn't even see so i, I want to know or i want to think about it and talk about what are the potential you know what, what could we use this for if it were to be able to fully uh if we could fully implement the technology and in, in the right way for civilization yeah. Yeah, and we've got examples of that. What industries could use it? How would it look? Uh, you know, what would be the drawbacks? What would be the benefits? Mm -hmm. All that stuff. So to get mm -hmm. us started, I got a little narration here on the world of superconductors and uh, sort of how they came to be and where we're at now uh, in the world of things. So this will be the uh, the homework, the catch up to get everybody on the same page. Mm -hmm. In a world where possibilities are endless and innovation knows no limits, we find superconductors those enigmatic materials that defy the ordinary bounds of physics. As we journey through time and unraveling the story of superconductivity, picture a bygone era in the early 20th century, where Dutch physicist Heike Kamerling Onnit stumbled upon a phenomenon that defied the norms of electricity. In today's world, we are presented with various breeds of superconductors, each with its own tale of scientific intrigue. High temperature superconductors like YBCO and BSCCO steal the spotlight, pushing the boundaries of power systems and medical marvels. Conventional superconductors, steeped in history, have paved the way for our understanding. Unconventional wonders like iron-based and organic superconductors add a touch of the extraordinary. 
Join us as we dive into a cinematic montage of superconductor applications that transcend science fiction. Witness the awe-inspiring role of superconducting magnets in the MRI imaging, which will revolutionize medical diagnostics. We will uncover the world of maglev trains where superconductors redefine transportation. Discover particle accelerators like CERN's Large Hadron Collider and how it has become a stage for scientific exploration. This isn't just science, it's a visual spectacle of industries transformed by superconductors. Imagine a medical realm where MRI technology further delves into the complexities of the human brain. Picture a transportation landscape setting new standards for speed and efficiency. Imagine an energy sector where superconducting power cables reshape the power distribution landscape. Every journey has its challenges, including frigid temperatures, economic puzzles, and technological mazes that have stood in the way of superconductor advancements. Whether you are a scientist in a laboratory or a future patient requiring technologies not yet invented, superconductors will change the lives of mankind and stands to improve the well-being of people all across the world. Great voiceover, man. Freaking great voiceover. I'm starting to look forward to them. Um, you're, I think you're muted. My, I think you're muted. on <laughs> Sorry, I do that to myself. Too. I am <laughs> muted. Yes, I was just shuffling my papers. Didn't want it to be uh, heard through the video. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. There, uh, that's just sort of an overview of where it can be applied. But to understand it at first, uh, I actually found a cool clip from Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's um, he's a polarizing guy, depending on what topic you want to discuss with or around him or about him. But Still a great storyteller. Great storyteller. He's a great storyteller, and when it comes yeah. to this kind of stuff, science, physics, um, I mean, that's his bread and butter, and he is uh, he is factual. So so let's hear it from the man, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, kind of the explanation of what are superconductors, why should we care, and uh, why it's such a big deal. Hey, you ever wonder about superconductivity? With possibly one of the most important scientific breakthroughs of the 21st century. It was claimed to herald a monumental breakthrough. Some are calling it the holy grail of chips, a superconductor. You might have heard about conducting materials. Metal is a commonly used conductor. Uh, copper is relatively inexpensive. It's bendable, so you can make wires out of it. And basically electrons move through the copper and it carries electricity. But you need a force to make that happen. You need a voltage that will drive a current. Okay. So as the electrons move through the medium, because it doesn't have to be copper, it could, it could be gold. Gold is a nice conductor of electricity. If it conducts, as the electron moves, it gets resistance from the material itself. And that resistance slows down the current. If it eats it, what does it then do with it? It heats up the wire, the wire gets hot. So for many circuits, if you feel the wires after a time, they feel warm. This is electrical resistance to the movement of those electrons. Sometimes you want resistance and we've made electrical components called resistors. This, this enables you to change the current from one place to another because not all current is useful in all places. So circuit boards have all manner of circuit components and it includes resistors for just this purpose. For some materials, there exists a temperature below which, and it happens abruptly, a temperature cold enough that below that temperature, all resistance drops to zero. You could take away the battery that's driving a voltage and whatever current was there will stay in the wire forever with no loss of current. That is super conductivity. So superconductivity is something you would want driving an electrical grid with no loss of current. There's lost current moving electricity from one place to another. And so if you could 
embed the entire electrical system in a very cold vat of liquid nitrogen, and you made all of your wires out of a material that would go superconducting at the temperature of liquid nitrogen, we would have no current losses anywhere. But who wants to live in liquid nitrogen, <laughs> okay? Liquid, at what temperature? It's 70 degrees Kelvin, all right? If you dipped a banana in liquid nitrogen and pulled it out a minute later, it'll and you could hit it with a hammer, it'll shatter. By the way, those would be high temperature superconductors. At that cold temperature, those are high temperatures because most of the traditional superconductors don't go superconducting until they are down around 10 degrees Kelvin, five degrees Kelvin, three degrees Kelvin, okay? And that's cold. No, you can't walk around with something that's four degrees Kelvin. Oh, by the way, officially we don't use the term degree, referring to Kelvin, it's just four Kelvins. But I'm letting, I'm reminding you that they are temperatures. So why is that cold? Because zero Kelvin is the coldest possible temperature you can get. It's the absolute temperature scale. Zero on the absolute scale has no negative temperatures, right? That is the coldest you can possibly be. So there's a hunt for a room temperature superconductor. The problem is many of them are made of ceramic, the ones that are approaching room temperature. And ceramic it tends to be brittle. Uh, our electrical system is made of wires that bend and go around corners and through conduits and pipes and up into your equipment and into circuit boards. Ceramic has a way of breaking if you bend it at all. So it is not clear how we would use ceramic superconductors in our culture relative to how we've been using electricity to this day. It's not clear how one would replace the other, or maybe we'd have to invent a whole new way of thinking about electrical components so that it's no longer in the context of wires. I don't know, but it is a frontier of material physics and the industrial applications in controlled settings are limitless. The question is whether it is portable to all of society. So another feature of superconductivity is that it rejects all magnetic fields. So what you can do a thing where you have a magnet attached to metal and it's attracted to it, and then you drop the temperature of that metal below its own superconducting threshold. And at that point, the magnetic field that had been penetrating it gets rejected out of it. And the magnet then begins to float on top of it. By the way, in Texas, Waxahachie, Texas, we began digging a hole to build the largest particle collider in the world that was going to use superconducting materials for the magnetic field that would be accelerating the charged particles to make the most powerful particle accelerator in the world. And it was called the Superconducting Super Collider. The initial funding began in the 1980s under President Reagan. And then early 90s, uh, Congress cut the budget. And the center of mass of particle physics moved to Europe, to Switzerland, to the, the European Center for Nuclear Research, CERN is their, is their acronym. And they then made the next round of discoveries. Not us here in the United States. Oh, why did we cut the funding? Oh, if you look at the report, it says, oh, it's cost overruns, can't do it, cost this, cost that. Oh yeah, really? Really? Oh, like really? What, what else happened in like 1989, 19, oh, 19, peace broke out in Europe. That's what happened. The Cold War ended. Oh, gone is the funding for the physics that we have so thoroughly funded for the entire 20th century. So no, the report doesn't say peace broke out. We don't need physicists anymore. No, it doesn't say that. But that happened right around that time. Just saying. So, 
Uh, so that would have been a scientific application fully exploiting superconducting materials to make the most powerful magnetic field you can to accelerate the particles and make the most powerful atom smasher the world had ever seen. Anyhow, that's what's up with that. This has been uh, Star Talk. Yield the So there you go. In a nutshell, that's why it is important what you could do with it. Um, you know, we've all heard of CERN and uh, it does run on superconductive materials, but like the cost and, um, you know, some of the, the gases used to super cool things, liquid nitrogen, liquid helium, which is what they use in MRIs, that sort of makes up the bulk of the expense with a lot of these devices is how they have to run. Even quantum computing, <clears throat> it's the low temperatures that is the biggest drawback right now. I mean, where can you, you can't just build a room and chill it to minus 350 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Like <laughs> no. it, it takes as could. much technology just to create the environment for this new technology in itself, right? And then of course there's the, the profit scheme. Governments are looking at this and to Neil's point there, Cold War ends. Well, we had physicists working on bombs and cool ways to destroy our enemies. Well, the war's over. Okay, we don't need science anymore. And I think that's what a lot of North America has done. Europe has never really seen it that way, but Europe is a less warfaring, I guess you could argue that, but in the last hundred years, Europe is less warfaring than even in, with the inclusion of the first and second world war. I mean, there's been more wars subsequently that aren't classified world wars, but it's a, a matter of priority. These things can be done. It's just a matter of who stands to benefit, who's going to foot the bill. And that's the biggest hindrance at this point. You know, Listening to that, first of all, again, great storyteller. I, I love the way that he talks about these complex ideas. I, I really wish I could emulate that um, maybe one day. But uh, although I, I have a lot of issue with a lot of his thinking about other things and how, how short-sighted he tends to be, he's a great storyteller, like I said. But I think the main issue that we hear often with these topics, with these technologies that could revolutionize civilization, take us to the type one civilization that's a part of the Kardashev scale. I'm going to calm. I'm getting a little excited, y'all. But it, it's crazy to me that we we constantly focus on things like cost, like for, forget about the the impact that it could have on human civilization. Oh, it costs too much money. Oh, we we can't afford it. Oh, well, there's a, we'd have to change the infrastructure. Well, then let's let's do it. Like if it's gonna make things better for the world, do it. Um, and I was you know like I said I was earlier I was uh, researching the other day or well, yesterday. Uh, an aspect of, of this of this technology being implemented across the world around the world and it would require require nations that well normally don't have i should let's just say friendly communication to collaborate and so the another really big issue of like for example a superconductivity being um used in one location of the world during the day providing energy towards another part of the world at night and then vice versa they could do that and have continuous um, production of energy and, and through this superconductivity, but they won't because the, the nations that are required to do this don't communicate well. They're not friends yeah. for, again, stupid reasons. So, man, it's it just it just kind of sucks that these amazing technologies they're all hindered by, you know, politics, cost, and and conflict. Yeah. Well, people are doing the work. It's just not getting where it could be by this point. Yeah. I mean, this guy won a Nobel Prize for this in 1913, over 100 years ago. This is not something that was discovered yeah. yesterday, right? Now, yeah. there's major challenges. They didn't possess technologies that would fully utilize that discovery. But the point is, this is not new information. Um, some of the uh, the things that were discussed there, um, both in my video and Neil's, yeah. uh, I think we need to clarify like the difference between a type 1 or a type 2 superconductor. Right. Right. In my video, I mentioned two different acronyms. One is uh, YCBO, or sorry, YBCO, which stands for uh, Yttrium Barium Copper Oxide. It's just a type of superconductor. Again, there is copper in there just because of the conductivity. But this is what it looks like, not your typical uh, gold or copper wire. And mm. this is a four-part alloy. So this is YBCO. And this is Barium Strontium, sorry, Bismuth Strontium Calcium Copper Oxide. So a five piece alloy so, it is the it's the black stone at the bottom. That's the element. The piece on top is just a magnet. I have a qu real quick, just because I know you were you were educating me on on this aspect, the type one and type two yeah. superconductors. From what I 
understand, at least at this point, is that the type one um, superconductors are made from basic pure you know, metals. Um, they're, you know, like, uh, I think, what is it like? Uh, let me see here. Yeah, it kind of goes with the history of these things. Initially, alloy work wasn't the same as just taking some silver or some nickel and seeing what happens to it. So type ones uh, were typically uh, pure elements, required yeah. a much, much colder, like they, they don't become super conductive until closer to that perfect zero temperature, minus three right. to minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So very difficult to work with. Um, and they could only handle very low magnetic fields. Whereas type two, sort mm -hmm. of the, the later generation of this technology that's continually researched, um, it is typically made out of alloys. It can be higher temperature. It's, you know, whenever you hear these things saying, oh, it's a high temperature. It's not actually high. It's just higher than minus 300. It's like minus 250. Still a very limiting, you know, spectrum to work with. Um, but they can hold much higher magnetic fields. And basically it comes down to this. So on the left, you have a normal metal. It is super conductive up into a point, and then it goes into a normal state. So it's very defined as to when it becomes super conductive, when it goes back to being magnetic, that type of thing. Whereas the superconductor type two, it has this mixed state. So it still has the first original superconductive state, but then there's sort of like a cool down or a continuation of that state uh, until normal. So it's not like an on or off. It's like an on, and then when you switch it off, it slowly goes down to normal. There's that yellow graph going down. Yeah. So the ability, like Neil had said, if you put current into a system with zero resistance, the current would go around that loop forever because there's nothing to slow it down. It's kind of like the tennis ball in in the uh, in outer space idea, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something there. It's so insignificant that in theory it would never it would never actually impact it, and uh, and that comes down to what's called the Meissner effect. This is sort of the explanation of it. Mm -hmm. So when you have heavy resistance, sort of the diagram on the left, all the uh, electrons are in contact with the elements. They produce heat. They cause loss. In fact, most energy grids have anywhere from 5 to 7% loss. So can you imagine mining a material and then 5% right off the top, you just throw away. That's essentially what happens in the energy world. Yeah. We pay for it as the consumer because the cost of goods includes that loss. Well, the second diagram where you see the arrows kind of curving around, that's an electron that's just kind of pushing its way through the material without interacting with the material. So then you have superconductivity and uh, it, it aids the ability to uh, for metals to levitate, stuff like that. So this levitation is known as the Meissner effect. Uh, it wasn't just Heike Yana's that came up with this. There were a few other um, you know, credible people along the way who have also done this type of thing. Um, but I do have a, a video clip that might explain that better of how how does something interact with a wire and then all of a sudden you make it cold and it doesn't. I mean, I still have a hard time understanding and I've been researching the crap out of it. <laughs> yeah, Maybe this will make a little more sense. But. As an electron moves through a conductor, it is repelled from other electrons due to their mutual negative charge. But it also attracts the positive ions that make up the rigid lattice of the metal. This attraction distorts the ion lattice, moving the ions slightly towards the electron, increasing the positive charge density of the lattice. At long distances, this attraction between electrons can overcome the electron repulsion and cause them to join. If the temperature of the material is low enough, the Cooper pair remains together. What happens now is that since an arbitrary many bosons can fit into the same low energy state, the collection of Cooper pairs starts acting like one entity or unit, and it's negatively charged, so this means it can conduct electricity. The lack of interaction of the Cooper pairs with the atoms effectively results in no resistance to the flow of electrons, and the material becomes a superconductor. This is like mat. It's like, I mean, they're operating on, on the level of subatomic. It's like magic, man. They're, I mean, I'm being obviously ridiculous, but it's like magic. It's it's the way that science is able to figure these things out and actually use it. Yeah, it's phenomenal. I, I I can't honestly. Sometimes I can't believe what we've discovered as we learn some of these topics. This is one of the ones that really really blows my mind. Yeah, um, and it's one thing it's, to. It's one thing if you're looking for novel new materials and new things. It's another thing to take what you already have and say, how can we apply these principles or this technology yeah. and how can we make what we have better? And uh, one example of that that I have here is um, uh, MRIs, of course. 
So let's take a look at where is my MRI? So essentially, an MRI is a giant copper, like a cylinder with almost like rebar and concrete. So you have this um, this uh, niobium titanium. That's the alloy that's being used. It's super conductive. It flows through this giant magnet. And that's essentially the type of magnet you need to create to pick up that resonance from the human body and to align with that sort of thing. So um, here are some examples of how MRIs work. The top diagram, it's basically like a washing machine in another washing machine in another washing machine. You have these different variations and layers. So you have the casing, you have a shield, then you have coils, uh, then there's a cold shield, and it is filled with uh, helium um, and then capped off. So the liquid helium is actually the most expensive part of the MRI. On the bottom there, you see on there's two MRI diagrams. The one on the left is your typical MRI that most places are implementing. It's a whole liquid hydrogen bath, and that's what keeps it at a constant cold temperature for that superconductivity to work. Without that, you wouldn't get the image, and the MRI would simply fail. But that is very expensive, and there is actually a, sh a, a shortage of helium worldwide. If you've tried to buy a cylinder for you know filling balloons lately, A, the cost is ridiculously high, and a lot mm -hmm. of times they're just giving you sort of a gaseous mix that's other light gases that is not necessarily helium because of the cost. They're trying to reserve helium for the medical industry, and this is exactly why. But the machine on the right, bottom right, you can see it just has these little bars of blue. So you have these helium packs that they're now stacking around rather than filling a tub with this stuff. You know, with the advent of new uh, new technology, new superconductors, you can now just cool down the areas that need to be cooled, thereby reducing cost and uh, and all the rest. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, CERN, as we know, this is probably one of the biggest super magnets on the planet. You're trying to generate the largest magnetic field. Um, this thing went up when it was launched to uh, 20,000 amps. That's how much power it ran. And I don't know how much amperage is running through the, your, uh, your typical street wire, but I know most homes are running a 100 amp service. So clearly the wire has more capacity because it's feeding a bunch of homes. But 20,000 amps is no joke, right? Just for doing science experiments. Yeah. And the temperature that this thing runs. So initially in 2008, when it was set, it took them uh, six weeks to cool it to minus 269 Celsius, which is minus 300 something Fahrenheit. Uh, it took six weeks to get that cold. And then once it started running, it did produce a slight amount of heat, but that was only enough to bring the temperature from minus 269 to minus 218. So much warmer by uh, by comparison, but still a freezing cold temperature to make make this thing happen, right? Yeah, and I, I keep asking myself, especially during this conversation and, and looking at these videos and, and these explanations of some of this science behind this, how much of this has been applied, at least in theory, uh, has been applied to actual science? So far, we've only got pretty much the uh, th this this collider, and that's it. I don't know any what else are we using superconductivity. I know we could use it for supercomputers, which I think there's um, there's uh, there's a supercomputer. I can't remember where it is now. Now that I'm I'm just randomly thinking about this in the moment, where they're using something like superconductivity or at least close to it, where they're trying to keep it really cool. But there's a there's a I guess there was a conflict with, and again I don't know. This is a vague memory. There was a conflict with the with the CPU, the chip they needed, um, the quantum computer chip, right? And and the conductivity or the super conductivity. I don't know the details of that at the moment. But yeah, I, I want to know like what, what what else did it apply to? Well, I do have some examples of that, and uh, we'll do it in the second half of the show here. Let's take our break. All right, let's not jump ahead. Coming on halfway point. Well, roughly halfway. We might go a little yeah. longer, but uh, rather than start something and then take a break, let's take our five minutes, get some more coffee, and then uh, I'll show you exactly where it's being used in uh, today's. Uh, and it's very exciting. I think that if we can just get our head straight, remove the politics and all the BS aside, look at what we could actually do here. I mean, we have the ability right. to things float without energy simply by changing their temperature or their pressure state mm. like think about what we could do with this right but i think it's a lot of people don't know the people making those decisions are not necessarily scientists they're the ones in charge of giving the scientists yep. money a lot of political factors different parties different belief systems even right down to the people signing the bill that have to vote on it that say yeah i don't think this is a good idea right it's hard to make something of it when mm. you're a believer and you're with the people that are doing the research 
but the people making the decision don't have to do the research and can just go with their gut and just say no. So we'll, uh, we'll chat about the rest of that uh, after our break here. Uh, So we'll see everybody back here in five minutes.
And we are back with the second half of Quantum Ladder Podcast. Today, we're going down the deep rabbit hole of superconducting. And uh, we talked a little bit about how it works, why it displays the properties it does. And uh, now we want to chat a little bit about what areas are already using this technology and where can it be used moving forward. And uh, a big part of the um, the importance of this stuff is, in fact, the levitation itself, that Meisner effect. And uh, we want to get into something called quantum locking. And that's going to sort of give you the basis of how that levitation happens. And now the technology is using that, why it actually works. So uh, here is quantum locking. So we have quantum locking. The, the superconductor is locked in space and it stays wherever I put it. You see, this is quantum trapping. That's and amazing. As, as long as it's So the cold, supercondu it's superconducting, it's frozen with liquid nitrogen. Upside down. Right. And it stays locked. So the fact that it's it's superconducting is locking the magnetic field in yeah. three dimensions, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's actually floating above the surface. Yeah, it's not floating; it's locked above the surface. So it could you could tilt it as an angle, and it would yeah, still fly around. Yeah, like this, and it will just go around like this. Because I go and put it at different height, and then like this. And lock it at the height. Lock right? it, yeah, different height, different configuration. Right. And I can even lock it at the uh, opposite way. If you could just hold for a minute. Okay. Hi. I'm doing the same so thing. Hang I'm locking down. it upside down, and then it is suspended. So, you want to go here? Let's 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 just take it to the next level, all right? Let's do it. I I wonder how this could be. How if this could be some of the technology that people see with UAP, right? No, I mean not not exactly because. Obviously, they need some kind of a, there's like a containment or there's some kind of a localized, um, if you, uh, I guess, assist. Like they had that, he had that large uh, circular platform that was locking that object around that perimeter. Yeah. So it wouldn't be something that it's free in space. At least not that I, that I've ever, I, could, I've, I know of or I could have seen. So the question is, could it be that there's someone using technology that is using something akin to this superconductivity? Um, or this quantum locking or whatever. Um, that's a, that's what I want to know. I would, I'd be really curious to know if that, I mean, who knows, right? It's a speculation and, and wonder, but I'm quite curious about that. Because when you see how they move, they move yep. almost as if there's no resistance, like zero yep. resistance in our atmosphere. How do you go from zero to 10,000 miles an hour recorded on, on radar with no, with no, with no sonic boom or anything, yeah. no tear in the atmosphere? That's kind of what I, what I, the, the and for sure. And it, it definitely, you know, if you want to go into the world of UAP, it appears that it is technological, but, you know, in some cases, but uh, it may not be as something as simple as, you know, a frozen magnet floating over a piece right. of steel. Exactly. Then you're getting into the world of metamaterials, materials that produce a waveguide just in their creation, mm -hmm. layers of, you know, different elements and, and yeah. fancy alloys that could behave that way, sort of creating that bubble and that distortion and gravity itself. And that would, in, in essence, be the world of superconducting. But again, too, you know, if you want to talk about like the gimbal video, when they look at that thing on a thermal, there's no heat. In fact, it's cold. It's colder yeah. than the air around yeah. it. So whatever's That's running that thing is running cold. Right. I don't know. And again, it looks pretty flimsy when you see a guy on a table with like this thing and he's just flicking it around. But it looks like you could just walk up and boot that thing and it would fall apart. But that bond is actually stronger than it looks. Here's an example of a guy doing the same demo, but he's like, pushing on it and trying to trying to mess with it, it doesn't move. It is that strong. In the last video, I showed that if I put a magnet above a superconductor, it kind of just floats there like magic. What I want to do now though, is show what happens if I do it the other way around. For this one, I'm using a much bigger superconductor and I'm again, cooling it with some liquid nitrogen. By now, it should be good, and I can take it out and drop it onto this little magnet track that I made. It actually stays on the track, and if I push it, it's able to move without falling off. It's also surprisingly strong, and even if I push it decently hard, I can't get it to touch the track. As it warms up though, it eventually loses its ability to superconduct, and it stops floating. That's cool. Yeah, cool. I've seen rigid. those. Like the guy's pushing it yeah. down, and when it's in its proper state, it will not touch. The bond is that much of a, a repulsion 
that uh, you don't run the risk of, of doing that. And uh, I mean, first thing that comes to mind when you think of that is this. This is a uh, maglev. Yeah. This yeah. is a Japanese concept from 2015. Essentially, mm -hmm. it's a train that runs mm -hmm. on that exact technology. Maglev stands for magnetic levitation. Um, they're, the current maglev idea or these high speed bullet trains run on it using just magnetic uh, repulsion. But using a superconductor would certainly increase the speed. Estimates that this speed can go over 650 miles an hour. That is faster wow. than a commercial jet. Um, you'd be able to go from L.A. to New York in 20 minutes. I mean, it's it's insane. There's one in China as well. This is what this looks like. So this isn't emerging. This is happening. These are not just concept mm. pictures. This is a real yeah. thing. And uh, I mean, transportation is a big thing. In many cities, the transportation is not great. That's why people don't take it. Hence the need for cars. We know the pollution and all that. Now we're trying to go electric. That's not going to save the planet. It's probably doing more damage than good. So anything that, um, you know, we're in, anytime there's a growing population and you implement something that can be applied to something as like wide reaching as transportation or medicine or like power, which are the other examples we have, uh, it's a big deal. You know, it's uh, you may not see the impact in the first day, week, month or year of this thing, but 20 years of running on those type of technologies would definitely be greater than what we've been doing so far. Yeah, you know, I was just seeing that the U.S. is investing billions in new transportation systems for like long distances. Um, yeah, I don't. They didn't talk about mag train or mag left trains or anything like that, but they are investing in some new ways of transportation, which is nice for long distances, which is nice to kind yeah. of bypass the traffic for shorter distances. I think that would be helpful for a lot of different commutes. Um, but I mean, I feel like in a lot of ways, Japan, especially in China. They tend to be advanced, much more advanced than we are in the U.S. when it comes to their technology. They they take a lot of, uh, well, I mean, they, they don't have as many, as far as I understand, regulations and um, and they focus heavily on their technology. If you ever look at yeah. some of the cities in Japan, they're like they're like futuristic freaking cities. It's they, they, even the, the smaller uh, like hotels or businesses have like these really auto, fully automated restaurants, completely robotic Um and, and they do the same thing in China, but it's it's so interesting how in the U.S. we seem to be the leaders in a lot of things. But when you look at other nations like Ch China and Japan, for example, there's a lot that they're they're far more advanced than us. And because of that lack of restriction when it comes to their technological push towards the yeah. future, they're pushing yeah. fast, like really, really and, fast. And Every you have a large an example of Japan. You've got a large population and a relatively small footprint, basically an island. There's only so much space. Yeah. So innovation becomes ne a necessity in order mm -hmm. for everybody to cohabitate and still maintain a certain quality of life. Plus, historically, they've always been great innovators. So now that's part of their culture and their pride mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we lead the world in technology. Some of the greatest electronics makers are Japanese. Yep. Whether it's built in China or Taiwan is a different story. The person who's right, engineering right. and making the designs and thinking about concepts, the uh, Jap Japan is definitely there. And China again, huge population. How do you move all these people? You know, in, in a communist-run state, the government's paying for all that, right? So, what's a cheaper way for the government to move over a billion people? Well, metals that le levitate is a pretty good start, you know. And there's lots. Yeah. Um, I mean, everything from in electronics, you've got sensors, supercomputers, cryoelectric uh, electronic components just means things that need to be frozen, kind of like in the MRI, uh, squid diagnostics, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, power generators, transformers, cables. I've got some pictures of cables we'll go through here in a sec. And then, um, you know, particle detectors, particle accelerators, microwave technologies, things like uh, antennas or um, delay lines. And then uh, magnetic transport systems like the maglev, ship engines. That's um, that's sort of where we're at here. Now, in terms of wires, we mentioned the loss and that a 5% loss to a utilities company has a whole lot of zeros when you quantify that in terms of dollars. So if they were going to run superconducting through our power grid and eliminate that, how would that look? So this company, uh, Nexens, has developed this power line it's a multifaceted line. There's many, many different parts of this. So it looks like a three or four uh, contact um, portion of this cable with the insulation separating each one. Here's another, another example. So you can run multiple things through this. They would run liquid nitrogen through the center. That little blue uh, spout coming out there, that's liquid nitrogen. 
and then there would be a return. So the smaller level would uh, use this to, to cool the inside and then it returned back through the top. So effectively, it would be a charge system that they would fill it with nitrogen and the nitrogen would just continue to circulate, always keeping that, that temperature cool, yeah. thereby cooling it to superconductivity level. There's no more resistance, no more loss, no more heat. So that's in effect what the power grid is doing. Uh, another thing, I know you're big on supercomputers. We did a quantum technology episode a couple months ago uh, where we discussed them. Here's the IBM supercomputer. Uh, here's a closer look. So effectively, this is designed to run in a cryogenic case. I don't know if you can see yeah. here. Last. So the whole thing would be cool to minus hundreds, whatever that looks like, whatever the Kelvin would need to be. And then uh, all the wires would be made out of superconductive material. And essentially, they're using this to uh, entangle qubits. Uh, and that's how a supercomputer would work. So more on the lines of plumbing than your typical electronics with circuit boards. <laughs> no conventional circuit board would work in a supercomputer. Have you found anything kind of a uh, you know, major difference-wise between supercomputers and what we all have at home and what we're making this show on right now? So... Let me. There's a couple of things I want to say about that, and then I'll and then I'll kind of you know address that specifically. But the, when I when I think about a, this technology, and of course we'll talk about superconductivity first, and then and then and then the supercomputers. But we used to have computers that were the size of you know they were mainframes, essentially yeah. bigger than mainframes today. You can buy a mainframe that's the, like the size of a couple of refrigerators. Um, nowadays, whereas before an entire computer, like a computer like what we're like working on right now, or your phone, for example, um, with less power had to be the size, I'm, I'm sorry, with more power was the size of a building, like yeah. a whole floor in a building. Now, today we have them in our pockets. So when you think about, oh, this, it seems implausible. It, it doesn't seem uh, very practical when it comes to the size of these types of technologies. Well, look at the difference between the first, the world's, that, that IBM supercomputer, which I've seen plenty of times, lots of documentaries. Look at the size of that thing. It's not that big. If you think about the origin of the computer itself to where, to where we are now, imagine where we will be in another 50 years or yeah. even, even 100 with supercomputers, of course, given what, what can be done with you know, uh, artificial intelligence, discovering new materials. Um, to be used for all different applications, including, of course, I guarantee they can use it for this. I mean, I can't see why not. It just, it, my mind always goes in the direction of the, 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 the potential is just unimaginable. I can't imagine what we're going to have. I used to think that AI would be talk to us like robots because of Siri. Now they talk to us like they're a person. Yeah. Um, no one really predicted, not many people predicted that. But when it comes to supercomputers, if we were to get a quantum CPU or a supercomputer, for example, it wouldn't actually be a supercomputer primarily. We would still use a, the current um, type of CPUs that we have, the current level of computing for basic tasks, things that we do um, for, for our simple applications and so forth. The quantum computer would be used for much more complex or specific or specialized tasks because yeah. of the way that the nature of, of how um, it's computing, it would be completely useless as a computer that we use them for today. There needs to be new applications for that quantum computer that require a much larger uh, computing power um, than what we use today with our current CPUs. That's from what that's what I understand about supercomputers. It would never yeah, really it would be definitely be overkill to have one of those things doing word processing. But effectively, yeah. you needed to sort of theorize and think about the futures of material big, science big to stuff, come up with novel yeah. elements yeah. and things that we wouldn't be able to think of. And even Chat GPT or AI tools using standard computing wouldn't be able to come up with. Right. So it's those really labor intensive things that either take time well, or take a lot of computing power that they can significantly uh, improve. If there's a, if there's a computer scientist in the, in the chat, go ahead. Roast me for if I'm wrong about this or saying it wrong. But what I what I could imagine an application for a supercomputer or that element of a supercomputer being on our current technology now or in the future, a combination of both. I you, you would use it for something like simulating, uh, uh, let's say you wanted to simulate an environment that was very specific to your um, your preference for. I don't know. Let's say you're using augmented reality glasses, for example, and you wanted to simulate a real life environment that's that's like the world that you live in, like a real world simulation. You want to go to the beach. You want to go to Vegas. You want to walk the streets of of you know a boardwalk at your favorite you know location, whatever. But you wanted to see it like you were there. You would use you. That's an application that you use supercomputing for because it's a mass amount of 
computation, um, a lot of computation that requires to to do that. Generative AI is it could be hugely benefited by supercomputer or supercomputing. Um, whereas today our current CPUs or GPUs that use for for them now, they do a great job, but they're not going to do what could be what you can imagine being done in the future, simulating real world things. That's what what I can see in supercomputers or that element of supercomputing being used for in our technology. I don't know if we'll ever get them on our phone. I'm not sure if we'll get like get them that small. I don't know. I mean, who knows at this point? But I could definitely see them in a laptop or desktop, um, and then being used for maybe in a cloud version of it being used for the for your on the go type of um, use cases. Yeah, the cloud makes a lot of sense. You'd have one, you know, major computer at this point in time. It would be the yeah. super cool technology. So you couldn't have something. Well, maybe you could, but at this point, you're not having anything minus 300 in your phone. There is no. no device small enough, or, or you know, but you could be. This could be a satellite, sort of remotely dialing into that cloud that has that computing power. So that supercomputer is still doing the work. You're just this is the receiver. This is the display of that. And really, it's just pulling it through internet connection rather than doing the yeah. actual computing in your phone. That is possible. But the big thing is the room temperature. And some of the biggest restrictions right now or <clears throat> things prohibiting the challenges, limitations prohibiting the science is the cost, the temperature, and in some cases, the environmental aspects of not everybody in all parts of the world would have access to this. There's political mm -hmm. things and inequalities. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of where does the fairness come in? who invents it and do they have do they have to share it with anybody else i mean that's a whole we could do a whole episode just on oh, the yeah. ethical implications <laughs> yeah. but the biggest thing is the room temperature versus not room temperature there's been a lot of buzz in the science world it's not the first time scientists have said hey we have a, a material here a metal that doesn't need to be super cool i mean imagine something that just floats and levitates like that at room temperature i mean that is the mm -hmm. holy grail of material mm -hmm. science uh, there was a um, a paper that was produced uh, and a uh, an element that was proposed out of Korea called LK99. It's a bit of a story, so I'll give it to you in pieces. This will explain why it's important and what is LK99, and then I'll give you the balance of the, the story. This could be the biggest physics discovery of our generation. A team of Korean researchers shocked the world recently when they announced they had discovered room temperature ambient pressure superconductors. This is a story we're watching very closely at Freethink and Hard Reset. Right now, there are teams of researchers at major national laboratories and universities, and even some folks at home, racing to try and replicate these results, because there's really good reasons to be skeptical about them. Early results have been very promising. There's something interesting happening with these materials, but it's not conclusively proved that this is a superconductor at room temperature. But if this is legit, it will change everything. Imagine super fast computers that don't produce any waste heat or clean fusion power plants, or things like an electric grid that is 100% efficient. That's before you get to things like floating trains. Room temperature ambient pressure superconductors would allow us to rethink everything about the modern world from scratch. And that's why... Mm -hmm. So, I mean, think about that. What could you actually implement? You could put it into everything if you could figure out a way to do it at room yeah. temperature yeah. and ambient pressure, meaning, it, you know, the normal atmospheric pressure we live in all the time it's all i think it's all about engineering I, honestly and it, this is why i wish we would uh, not to pontificate but i really wish that we would change the way that we are as civilization just is um we everyone refer back to our venus project episode it could be done the problem is, is that there's a lot of hindrances with uh with just the nature of our of our society the nature of the structures you know that we live in yeah yeah uh, I got another clip here before I give you the update on LK99. Um, this one I have saved. I just named it Room Temp Quantum Computing. So that same benefit of something being room temperature, not only for transportation or energy or whatever, but what does that look like if we could get quantum computers at a room temperature level? Does that increase accessibility, that type of thing? In the near term, there are these incredible applications. Quantum computers are built using little superconductors as the qubit. So this idea that we could now have room temperature quantum computing is also game a very changer. profound one, game yeah. changer. Electric motors could be reinvented. Semiconductors, integrated circuits would be reinvented. If you had enough of this material, you could put it in roads. And because superconductors also reflect magnetic fields, you could put magnets on the bottom of cars and float them above the ground and cruise around without any friction less accidents too right you, you can decide so that would, there would never be an accident ever it's impossible yep. for there to be an accident
So yeah. if people really want to, you know, another resistance that we would receive is like the cultural uh, people, people there. I, I jokingly talk about uh, the kind of person that like they love their trucks and, you know, love their gas guzzling, you know, diesel trucks or whatever. Um, I love a good truck, but when it comes to like, you know, like, I don't know, um, to, to practical applications or just efficiency and just having a better world, these would be, I think that that, that kind of change would probably be resisted. I mean, people resist a lot of uh, new technological changes. We talk about that. Um, we talked about that on some of the first episodes we had that, that people are very generally, especially in the U.S., are very resistant to anything that makes them feel like it's going to take away or change the way that things have always been. They don't yeah. like that kind of change to their to, to their life. But um, but I do think that if this is possible, man, I mean, imagine the, the, the cities being you drive a car, but you never get into an either be zero accidents, zero. It, it's impossible. Yeah. So. Yep. And um, there are certain environments not on Earth because we live in a certain temperature range and certain pressure range. But as of now, we know that these things require extremely cold temps. So scientists are thinking, OK, well, where is an extremely cold temperature already that we're playing around in where we can benefit using this? And of course, our friends NASA in uh, outer space outer space is extremely cold. So what happens when you use sort of superconductors in conjunction with space programs? And this was a uh, MIT um, sort of theory. So essentially, by using superconductor as, uh, as a support structure, you could reduce the spacecraft's uh, structural mass. So um, obviously lighter, less fuel, you, or you can carry more payload. There's benefits to that. Uh, a larger structure would be possible without uh, or with using the existing um, vehicles that we have, launch vehicles. So again, they all come down to fuel, payload. If you could make it lighter, you could effectively take a bigger ship because it weighs the same amount. It's going to take the same amount of fuel and propulsion. That's all rocket science is based on. How much weight are we moving? How fast do we need to move it? And how far do we need to send it? So the lighter you make it, you can therefore make it larger and increase your payload just because of, of that. And uh, I thought that was amazing. Um, of course, they wanted 500K for a two-year study um, analysis, modeling, that type of thing. But um, yeah, I mean, in, a, in an atmosphere that's already, or an environment that's already extremely cold, this can be used right out the gate, providing, you know, these are legit. When yeah. you have people that, um, you know, that are, are talking about novel, you know, metals and things like that, that aren't tested, there can be some trickery. And in fact, there has been, but, uh, but what are your thoughts on that so far, Marquise? Do you think, um, NASA has this type of stuff in action. Should they be allowed to play with it? And the Probably rest of us can't. Like, where should this really go to benefit humanity? Well, you see Elon Musk is going to Mars. Maybe they're they're on another planet. Maybe NASA is actually using this tech on another planet. They just don't tell us about it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I jest. But I I mean, I, I think about the idea that this. there's a couple things I think about. The idea that, like, we have – that we probably have lots of – first of all, we, we know that we have technology that's classified, right? There's – tech that can't be presented to the public. I mean, you couldn't give the nuclear ingredients, uh, the nuclear bomb ingredients to the world. Like, hey, this is freedom of information. Um, just going to tell you how that works. That's a bad idea. Um, so I'm sure that there are technologies just like this that are probably classified um, in relation to superconductivity. I wondered, you know, the, the controversy with the LK99, um, because they said it wasn't, they said that it wasn't verified. That was a big controversy when after they, they announced it. Um, because people couldn't prove it. They couldn't replicate it yeah. themselves. They couldn't prove it. So that was interesting to see that being talked about here in this, which I appreciate you brought that in here. Because because although it's something to celebrate in terms of a potential achievement for for, our, for, for engineering and technology, you know, I, wonder, I wondered, my first thought was, and I know this is going to sound conspiratorial. I apologize. This is just where my mind goes. Did they suppress it? Maybe, maybe they discovered something that was like, oh, crap, this could be used for... Maybe this isn't so great to just give out to the world. And so they, they suppressed the details on how to replicate that technology. I don't know. Um, yeah. But I can't imagine that they would be friendly to the U.S. and be like, hey, let's just let's just tell the world how we, you know, revolution. Even though they're scientists, just like the, in there collaborating with other scientists around the world, I can imagine that the, a discovery that could potentially give them an edge being shared e openly with the U.S. or anybody else for that matter. So, yeah, who knows? I don't know. I don't know. But. I don't want to. I will not. I will not just cast a, sh a shadow of doubt too much on the LK99 because 
we just don't know. We don't. We can't verify at least yet. But there. But as he said, we're promising experiments that have been done, um, even by people, regular people. So there's something to it. Yeah, for sure. And as we know, most technologies, when they're, you know, have a, a significant value, they go right to the military, and then it becomes right. classified, right. patented for fifty years. You know, only, only <laughs> yeah. yeah, only certain vendors are allowed to work on it, and it becomes proprietary and all the rest of it. So. It, whether keeping these things in the hands of the right people and out of the hands of the wrong people is a difficult thing because who's the right people and who's the wrong people no, that opinion decides? changes based on yeah. who you are and what side of the fence you're on right like yeah who gets to play who doesn't what are the ethical implications of this stuff you know should we not be using this to help health care and help save people's lives not create cooler bombs to end more lives but uh, but there has been an update on the lk99 uh, this is a lady here who put a video together um and uh, so let's check out since that initial video korean scientists there were some people from india as well um working on this project their claim was it's a room can room temperature superconductor but again science wanting to prove it replicate it repeat it that's good science people weren't able to do the same thing in the lab now was that because they just didn't know how these guys did it they're not going to give you the secret recipe like you said or was it that there was something wasn't quite legit? So here's the update on LK99. The superconductor LK99 does not appear to be passing the sniff test. India's National Physical Laboratory and Beihang University in Beijing have said that LK99 exhibited characteristics of just being diamagnetic and not a superconductor. Diamagnetic means that it's repelled by a magnetic field. So it can cause this floating effect, but it still has a bit of electrical resistance. Lots of things are diamagnetic, like copper, and gold and water, actually. They're highly conductive, which is why we use copper wires for pretty much everything. But that little bit of electrical resistance is also why those wires heat up. Materials like that, in theory, could be used to trick an observer into thinking that they're looking at a superconductor because superconductors also repel magnetic fields. But while copper is just diamagnetic, superconductors are perfectly diamagnetic, meaning that there is no resistance. They're not hard to make. The problem is they only work at ultra low temperatures and needs liquid nitrogen or helium to stay cool. That's not realistic for commercial use, which is why they're only in fancy things like MRIs. To pass the test, LK99 needs to work at room temperatures and conduct electricity perfectly without resistance because a room temperature superconductor would change our world, making technology smaller, computers faster, and our electrical bills would go down. Results are still trickling in from all over the world, checking the validity of LK99 so maybe there's still a surprise or two in here for us. I don't listen. This let's just be honest. She's smarter than me. All right, let's just. I'm just gonna tell you, but I disagree. I I don't like her presentation. Uh, or she clearly has not just skepticism, but like, like a little bit of mockery about this about this LK99. Um, but without any, there's no definitive evidence of it being a, a um bad like fake or anything. There's Again, she even ended with there's still, you know, things being tested and, and evidence or uh, data being uh, presented uh, in relation to this LK99. So we don't know. But I do want to mention, and I know we all know about, uh, was it Stanley Meyer, um, who created, he, the, he's a dude that created the water-powered car, or the water-powered, I'm sorry, um, uh, powered car that could travel pretty long distances on nothing but, literally nothing but water. And... They said the scientists at the time and the U.S. Patent Office, of course, said, oh, it's it's just not the quote was it's not feasible. They could it's not possible. And then they essentially suppressed the technology, suppressed him and his technology. Um, he ended up dying under some interesting circumstances. Not that these, you know, this again, conspiratorial if you want to. But that's just one. The, the electric car, um, the GM electric car that was suppressed. Um, and, you, and, and there's a lot of technologies that have been literally, literally taken off the table because especially by if you want to talk about some people that suppress technologies general electric do you really think that if this technology is viable on a consumer level that they would just oh you know what it's going to reduce people's electric bills this let me just tell you guys one month when i was a, a much younger person my electric bill was higher than my rent for one month and i didn't even know like one i got a i got a bill and i thought it was a mistake now, what what is this? And they were like, oh, it's happening all across our our location, around my location. People were receiving three to four months 
of an electric bill that was higher than their rent money. We're talking a lot of money, a lot of money. And they didn't change their 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 energy habits at all. And they claimed, oh, it was just the, your energy usage is changing and you just don't recognize it. There may be an there may be an issue with the wiring or whatever. OK, cool. Uh, not cool. Then they would offer you this plan, this payment plan that you can get on. So you didn't so you wouldn't, you know, be homeless from paying uh, four months rent in, in one month. And and that essentially kept you paying the electric company far more than what you've been paying. Plus, you now you owe them money. Now you're in debt to them. Yeah. And they can't set your electric off, by the way. So they, it, it's, I don't know, man. I, I, I feel like I feel like we need to wait for the verdict to be out on the LK99. I have hope for it. I think there is something to it. They wouldn't announce the world if there wasn't. But I definitely think that even if there is some real applications on the consumer level, it's not going to be implemented. There's no way. It will not be implemented. It will not. I can't, I can't imagine. It's totally possible that that info was suppressed. Now, the latest update as of June of 2023 was that uh, those guys were faking it. Apparently, it was a fraud. They uh, they fabricated and manipulated data. There was, um, mm -hmm. I think, their initial paper was submitted for peer review. There's a group of scientists that sort of BS and fact check to make sure people aren't just coming up with crazy ideas, and uh, they found that. They went to the original contributors to the report yeah. and said, like, where's your data? This doesn't make sense. They gave them the data that they provided these researchers and the guys doing the audit are like, this isn't what made it in the report. This is the data you gave. That's not what they said here. And mm -hmm. uh, they actually yanked uh, the privileges of that group. They, they uh, redacted their paper. And um, the scientific body basically came out and said that LK99, not that um, room temperature superconductor, yeah. don't exist or can't. Just this particular example was actually the second time that this uh, group of people have been found to do this type of thing. I don't know mm. if it was trickery. As she said in the video, there is a difference between diamagnetic and perfectly diamagnetic. Before the show, we were chatting and you were like, I don't know about this levitation thing. I've seen people levitate yeah. frogs in a cylinder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can make something magnetic that will levitate, but it doesn't have anything to do with the superconductivity. It's levitating for a different reason. Superconductivity right. is the repulsion of that magnetic field, not just two metals that have opposite charges that will naturally repel, right? The effect yeah. looks the same. The point being that if you're a smart scientist and you know how to play with this stuff, you can make it look like something that it's not. You can make materials do things just like a magic trick, but to do that and submit it to the science world where you know there's some proper brains out there, you're either really stupid or you thought you were very <laughs> smart. Or yeah. it's something a little more diabolical. Maybe these people are told to shut up. The government, you know. <laughs> Listen, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to represent the Right? Teleportation, levitation. U.S. government owns patents and all that stuff. So I don't know how you can own a patent on a theoretical idea without providing some basis that, like, no, it would work. Here's how it would work. Here's the, the studies to back that up. We want to patent this because we figured it out. I'm pretty sure that's the only way you get a patent granted. Otherwise, anybody would just patent some stuff just in case one day somebody invents it, right? So, yeah, rules. Yeah. Not a patent lawyer, I don't know, yeah. but wouldn't be surprised if um, there's more to this than we actually know, right? Oh man, we could go. We can. We could do an entire two episode, two series episode, probably more than that. A whole week series episodes on uh, suppressed technologies that have that were that were that were taken by companies like again General Electric, GM, and and, and the FBI as well literally raiding scientists uh offices and data and then somehow there there was a a guy who invented i can't oh my gosh now i can't i don't even want to say it but there there was there was some very interesting stories and and these are documented and on the internet you could we can we're gonna when we if we ever do do a, uh, an episode about suppressed technologies which i guarantee we probably will um we'll talk more about the specifics but they burned down entire uh labs people's labs you know, we're talking about citizens that are working on technologies that could change the world. They burn their labs down or they mysteriously burn down after an FBI investigation where they take all the data. And here we are. We have, we're left with nothing, left with no with none of the tech. So uh, is LK99 an example of one of those? I have no idea. The fact that they've been that these this uh, this and I didn't know that, by the way, the fact that this group of scientists has been known for fraud, fraudulent activity before makes yeah. me wonder why are they still conducting scientific um, uh, and, and experiments, and then why is anybody taking them seriously in the first place? Why do that? That's what 
to me, the very first thing that should have come out is these guys are fake. They've always been faking stuff. I never trust them. Instead, people were experimenting. They were testing LK, this, this LK99. Things were looking promising. And then all of a sudden, oh, they're fake. They're lying. They've done this before. They're bad. To, to me, to somebody looking at this from the outside, having the, the, you know, the groundwork for the conspiracy that have been out there forever and ones that are true, by the way, conspiracy doesn't mean uh, false allegations. It just means that there's it means a conspiracy. Um, and there is a lot of conspiracies that have turned out to be true. I think that this could be not necessarily a conspiracy. You can call it that if you want to. But this could be an example of suppression. But it could also be a couple of uh, a group of scientists that have been fraudulent, uh, have been doing fraudulent things uh, in the past. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I just don't I, like the way that it looks. Yeah, It's a fine line, right? Because as a scientist, you're allowed to be wrong and make mistakes. That's the whole point of peer right. review. I'm saying, hey, this is what I found. Everybody else take a look. Try to replicate it. See if you can contribute to that. So you can sort of hide in that world of, hey, I'm just a scientist doing what we do. I thought it worked. This was my initial research. Guess I was wrong. It's easy. But to your point, if they've already been known as fraudsters, why would the scientific world even take them seriously the second time around, yeah. right? That's, yeah. Academia no. doesn't really have a lot of patience for that, especially when no. many people are very dedicated to accuracy, spend their entire lives maintaining accuracy. And really, it's it's like their honor that they would never do that. So when you're in that world and you do do that, it's like a crooked cop or a, a dirty doctor. The rest of your peers shut you down. They don't even want to talk yeah, about they, it. Yeah. So why would you, with a good <laughs> reputation, take on these guys' study with any real, you know, uh, effort or trying to see if it's legitimate or not, you would just write them off and say, wow, these guys are full of it. They've done this before. So I don't know how it all came to be, whether again, they're lying in the, the depths of, you know, we thought it did. Apparently it's not. And again, what's the benefit? Was it funding? I know two of the guys that were disbarred. One is a professor at the university of Arizona, the other one somewhere else. So they're legitimate people with day jobs too. You would think that, this could negatively affect that if they were playing games again, too, you could also proportionately increase your job. If you're seen as this guru genius, you know, universities be throwing money at you to have you teach their students. Right. So mm. motivation isn't hard to find or motive just in general, why you would want to cheat. But uh, at some point you must think that you're going to be found out or you just think you're that smart and you're never going to get caught. But in essence, if you can't put this into a real material and have it do what it's supposed to do, the money's going to dry out anyway because it doesn't work. It's not real. So I don't know mm -hmm. what the, the gameplay was. I don't know if they're being manipulated. It is curious, though, that two of them are of different ethnicities. It's almost like if America wants to be the uh, they want to regain that title of the scientific power of the world when they clearly mm -hmm. gave it away to the Europeans 30 years ago. But <laughs> but this is where we lie. I um, mean, this is uh, again, it's a deep topic. We can go back and forth all day on it. But it's important to know that in a lot of these things moving forward, in a lot of this nanotechnology, it's one, th one thing if you make something super small, but if you can make something that's super conductive, the size doesn't matter as much because effectively you're getting the same thing. You're trying to reduce load. You're trying to reduce resistance, yep. make things flow easier, faster, less, less you know, bogging down the system, so to speak. And that's uh, effectively why these technologies are important. And the first one who can really get there, uh, it's game over. But again, does that become now a patented product that the rest of the world can't use? I struggle finding ways of seeing how humanity is going to benefit from this, unless it's the healthcare industry that happens to find this out. But then again, there's um, access limitations. Not everybody has access to healthcare, free healthcare. What if a scan is double the price, but twice mm. as good? Oh, you can't afford that scan. Well, then you get the crappy scan. Like there's a lot of yeah. ethics that go in with that. And on the bright side, though, even though LK99 appears like it was a bust, the mm -hmm. latest sort of exciting thing are in things called superhydrides. So like hydrogen sulfide. And um, it's basically the next up and coming way of making a superconductor. It does not need to be super cooled. Um, but the problem with that is the pressure. So for these superhydrides mm -hmm. to work, they would have yeah. to be pressurized to basically the same pressure as the core of the planet. So not very feasible right now. I mean, <laughs> but in, yeah. it is another way of achieving the same thing with a totally different um, sort of method of getting there. Nothing to do with cooling. This one's pressure. So I like the fact that these yeah. results can be had with many different technologies. We just need to get smarter and better at finding alternatives. 
the fact of the matter is it can be done. We've seen demos of what, you know, what you can do with metals, locking them into place and things like that. The future of technology and transportation and energy looks good. But again, to uh, be aware of the nefarious ones that stand to you know, profit from this and also benefit from not sharing it with others. Proprietary mm -hmm. information is the greatest way to increase your stock share, right? So, well, apparently, like ChatGPT, for example, the the AIs, the generative generative AIs, and the conversational AIs, these types of artificial intelligence applications have been used by business CEOs, corporations for years. We're just now getting a peek at what they've been using for years. Yeah. So this is not. I mean, it's new to us, um, but there are a lot of technologies that were out sometimes 40 50 years prior to when they were released to the public usually like you mentioned before by the military first they tend to have military applications some of them some technologies tend to have military applications first they find a way to make it into, and i don't understand why they would do this in the first place but so you know i this it just occurred to me why would a military contractor who is developing technologies for the military right um say you know what let's Let's give this to the consumer, to the consumers. <laughs> Doesn't yeah, that sound a benefit? little fishy? The benefit is that they're making, they're profiting off of it. You know, this is, a, we're, I mean, we're, we're obviously being rhetorical, but the, but the question is, doesn't that seem a bit unfair to other businesses that don't have that proprietary advantage where they're, where they're getting these technologies and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, let's use this to, to apply to the consumer realm and of course get mega rich. It, it, I never think that any company that has any of these, the leading company, Apple, Google, whatever, first of all, Google specifically, they've been working with the military privately for, for a while in a lot of different, I mean, Google Maps is literally a military technology, but it was before it became a consumer one. And so, you know, the, the funny thing to me is that, is that we're looking at all of these technologies and the potentials and all that stuff. And one day they could be implemented on a consumer level, but whatever it is, Remember one thing, ladies and gentlemen, we will never fully benefit from any of these tech. We will benefit some, but unless things change, which is what I hope for, unless we get to that Venus Project 2.0, um, that's more aligned with the way the world is going now. It doesn't have to be exactly as it was presented in, in this show that we did. It could be vastly different because we have a completely different framework for what's possible. But either way, unless we make that change, we'll always get the bits, the crumbs from the master's table. So, yeah, for sure. If the system is sick, nothing can work properly in the system. Everything is inefficient, unfair, yeah. um, you know, unproportionate. So if the system can't bear what we need it to, then fundamentally nothing we invent or develop is really going to help humanity. Right. It's a, not really. It's, it's not something we're going to change overnight, but it is a fundamental rethinking of everything, how we do business, yeah. how we do research, how science participates with other bodies, how governments participate with one another. And I think we're very good at saying, I'm not going to play ball with you because I don't like you or your grandfather or my grandfather had a problem 80 years ago yeah. and we're going to continue that grudge moving forward. Or Nothing worse, a thousand years ago. Not, yeah, I mean, everybody's <laughs> justified at some point. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's uh, we got to kind of put that all away. I'm sure if uh, non-human intelligence does exist, they didn't get that advanced by blowing themselves up and through war. It wasn't war that drove the technology machine. It was technology that drove the machine of life. And that's that's the the fundamental difference, well, right? Well, either they either they did or they didn't, right? Either there is a there either they are the dominant species on their planet by domination. <laughs> yeah. Or they worked cohesively. Um, and they discover, I mean, it, it's either way, collaboration is, is essential. Um, if you want to really advance things, no matter what, whether you're a warring, warring, you know, civilization or not, at some point, the wars need to end. There needs to be some kind of unification um, of the civilization to be able to focus on things like engineering and technology and true progress for civilization versus, you know, these political, it, it, I, I, my brain literally shuts, like it, it tweaks the moment that I say political you know, political motivations or political anything, because that's essentially what leads and governs a lot of decisions that are made for society, for all of us. You know, it's somehow it's politics and bureaucracy. I don't know. Yeah.
Yeah, the collaboration's got to be there. I mean, if there was a cataclysmic extinction event every 10 years, life wouldn't really get much further than uh, single-celled organisms, even if that. So there's yeah. something to be said for longevity, consistency, having peace reign for large chunks of time, rather than let's just start over, start over, start over. At some point, you can't get on to the next topic if you're fighting a war. And I think, you know, even if some society did uh, gain dominance by being dominant, they're yeah. still not as efficient as they could be yeah. because what yeah. more could they be doing with collaboration of the rest of their own kind, right? And we're in a perfect example of that. Everybody knows you get more with a group. Two heads are better than one, that type of thing. So even if we are the smartest group and we happen to dominate, which kind of like humankind has now, has there done, are yeah. no really, you know, um, um, you know, uh, Neanderthals. I mean, they exist in our genetic record. We interbred with them. But as far as the domi dominant species on the planet, it's Homo sapiens sapiens. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you could argue we got there by war and things like that, too. But at some point, there has to be collaboration and cooperation or it's going to be too short lived. You never get to become a, a Kardashev scale type one or type two civilization. <laughs> if you're just constantly focused on spending all your resources on war, well, when you have a declining health of your population, declining health of your planet, and a declining resource abundance, eventually that's mm. going to catch up to you. So, I mean, we're thinking in human terms, a couple hundred years is a very small number, but a big number for us. Thousands and millions of years, these impacts become amplified enormously. So in the grand scheme of things, if we're going to be around another million years, we need to fundamentally change a lot of the things we do, how we do it, how we think, how we treat other people. Do we uh, cast doubt on things without even having proper information? You know, like even dialogue and debate is seriously altered and not yeah. for the good in some cases. Right. No. So, no. Yeah. We, the, I, I once heard and I, we're, we're kind of pontificating at this point. Drag, I apologize. But I once many, many times I do this all the time where I watch debates with people that are politically driven versus um, like data driven and people that are politically driven. They take data that that tells a story and then they create a new story and because it's possible if the viewer or listener doesn't understand the data or understand the scope of the data they're easily convinced because the data is convincing yeah like I, I again i was like oh my gosh that is a very that's a super convincing argument for said said topic but it's clearly lacking the like the full scope of that data it's like they call it cherry picking um honestly that makes me think about my next statement, which is that if we were a more informed public, a genuinely informed, if we were more interested in the truth of things and being data driven when it comes to looking at these these kinds of all kinds of topics, I think that we couldn't be fooled by whatever narrative may be presented to us by the powers that be. And to be honest, we can I could we can point the finger at, you know, this person, that person, this. But I feel like it's us. We have to decide the people we us, the people have to decide what kind of civilization we want to be um, by being more honest with ourselves, and of course being more empathetic towards other people, understanding our symbiotic relationship to everything, especially each other, but, but also importantly, the world that we live in and the nature, uh, the, the biome that we have to take care of. We only, we only have one earth, as they say, um, we better figure it out before we don't have anything left. Yeah. Yeah, well said. And uh, kudos to everybody that uh, watches these episodes and wants to get into these things and educate themselves and maybe look at the world a little bit differently. That's uh, our sole motivation is to give you this this data, pique your interest, and uh, you'll start to notice more of these articles and topics floating around now that you've maybe seen a show about it. It's how the universe will work, right? More of this stuff will start popping up in your life and on your feed yeah. and uh, having a healthy understanding of it without needing to be a PhD. Neither one of us are, but uh, it's important to know why things are important it kind of helps in today's world where everything is thrown at you and you're bombarded with a bunch of stuff knowing how to separate priority and importance and categorize everything really makes it easier to digest otherwise you're literally just bombarded with stuff all day long and you're not really uh, doing anything productive so in the world of research it's important to know where we've come from how others have failed what to watch out for what are the motives of some of the players that want this thing to happen? And what are the motives of some people that maybe don't want it to happen? And at least then when you read an article, you very quickly can pick up the bias. You could say, oh, this is politically driven or this is in favor of a certain university. Well, yeah, no wonder they wrote the damn article, right? You can start being not skeptical, but you'd be a little bit sharper. 
you're a little more filtered in terms of what you allow in the, oh, I saw this the other day. Whittle it down. There's a lot of junk out there, but there's a lot of good stuff. And um, we just want to bring you that information and, uh, and um, you know, have a little bit of fun when we do these shows. And nice chat with everybody in our chat room. We always enjoy that. Everybody always has uh, lots of very um, interesting things to say, share their own experiences too. So, um, you know, that's a compliment to us that people feel comfortable enough to do that. And uh, we really appreciate it. So with that, Marquise, I'll give you the final word, my man. Yeah, I, um, I just want to say there was a quote by the philosopher um, Krishnamurta. And it's a, it's a quote that I think about a lot. And if you're out there, if you're one of the people out there that sits around and you're frustrated with the way that things are in the world. And if you're here, you're probably one of those people. If you're looking at the way the world, the, the world is, the, the government and the scientific community when they're suppressed technologies or when they're when or when for example there are things that are that should be implemented that are not and you know the things that could be better if you're frustrated with things and you just and you have this uneasy feeling within yourself that something isn't right here remember that it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a sick society very well said absolutely and uh keep that in mind folks and uh with that we'll bring today's episode to a close Another one uh, bites the dust, Marquise, as they say. Uh, this was a lot of fun, and uh, we're going to keep working on more interesting topics and compelling ones for our audience here. Give us a thumbs up if you like our content, and subscribe to our channels if you have not. And with that, take care of each other, everybody. We'll see you next time.